In this lecture, we take you back to the years 1947, 1948, when the first Dead Sea Scrolls came to light as they emerged after their fortuitous discovery at the site of Qumran. We, be we begin at once to read passages from the scrolls, imagining ourselves to be the first scholars who laid eyes on these ancient Hebrew texts. Two of them are copies of the book of Isaiah, five of them we have never before seen. We hardly know where to begin as we feast our eyes on this remarkable discovery. But before we get to the reading of the texts, we need to revisit the story of their discovery, which I mentioned briefly in Lecture 1 and which I now present to you in greater detail. Sometime in the spring of 1947, the local Bedouin, they are the only inhabitants of this region around the Dead Sea, the local Bedouin were shepherding their flocks, comprised of sheep and goats, somewhere along the shore of the Dead Sea. One of the goats strayed from the herd and climbed up, goats being great climbers, climbed up on the cliffs above Qumran. The goat entered into one of the caves. Now the shepherd lad, smart young man that he was, did not climb up after the goat, but instead picked up a stone, threw it into the cave, hoping to scare the goat out, and the goat would then return to the flock. Instead of the expected thud of a stone hitting the ground inside the cave, he heard a ping. Inquisitive, he took another stone, threw it into the cave, and heard another ping. Well, this aroused his interest even more, and so at this point, the Bedouin shepherd climbed up into the cave, and there he saw two earthenware vessels, clay pots, tall, thin pots, opened them up, and inside he found the first seven Dead Sea Scrolls. We like to quip that at this point we lose track of the goat, who is our real hero of the story, though most likely the goat safely returned to his herd. Now, the Bedouin kept these scrolls with them for a few weeks or so. The Bedouin typically are not able to read or write any language. They speak Arabic. They certainly would not have been able to recognize the script or the language presented in the script of these seven ancient documents that they now held in their hands. On a regular basis, the Bedouin will visit the closest city, which in this case is Bethlehem, where they will do some trading. They will trade their own wares, which are typically uh, uh, from the goat herds and the sheep herds, goat skins, wool, milk products, and so on, and they will trade them for things that they need, perhaps a pot or a, a, another kind of vessel of some sort, or whatever they may need from the various little stores in the city of Bethlehem. So the next time they made their way into Bethlehem, the Bedouin sold these scrolls to an individual named Kando. Now Kando was a shoekeeper, a cobbler, shoemaker, a cobbler in Bethlehem, and he also was an antiquities dealer on the side. And so they gave the scrolls to Kando for an agreed upon sum of money. For reasons that we really don't know, Kando decided to divide the scrolls up into a group of three and a group of four. Kando, in turn, very quickly, in July of 1947, sold four of the scrolls to an individual named Mar Samuel, the Metropolitan of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem. Kando also contacted Professor Eliezer Sukenik of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem sometime in November of 1947, in order to determine whether Professor Sukenik was interested in purchasing the other three scrolls. So four of the scrolls Kando sold to Mar Samuel, head of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem. We'll get back to his story in a moment. And the other three he offered to Professor Sukenik to see whether he was interested in obtaining these scrolls. Now I need to give you a little background of the time, not the time of antiquity that we've been talking about, but what was going on in Israel, specifically, specifically in Jerusalem, in the year 1947. During this time period, the British mandate in Palestine was still in place, although the British had handed over authority to the United Nations, asking the United Nations to come up with a plan by which a Jewish state and an Arab state could be created in the land of Palestine. It was a dangerous time period, and as a Jewish scholar living in predominantly Western Jerusalem, predominantly Jewish Western Jerusalem, 
Professor Sukenna could not with any ease travel to Bethlehem to meet Kando to see these three documents that he was being offered for sale. What Professor Sukenik did, and as I said earlier, this does sound like a spy novel or a thriller from time to time, Professor Sukenik dressed up as an Arab. He walked from predominantly Jewish West Jerusalem to predominantly Jewish, predominantly Arab East Jerusalem, and there he boarded a bus near the Damascus Gate outside the old city walls, and he took that bus to Bethlehem, a totally Arab city. So there, Professor Sukenik, disguised as an Arab, meets Kando, the shoemaker, cobbler, slash antiquities dealer, and he sets his eyes on the three scrolls, and he buys them with money supplied by his home university, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Sukenik returns with the scrolls in his hand and returns to his home safely, where he begins to open these scrolls and read them carefully for the first time. In his diary, Sukenik noted the following coincidence. He was reading these texts on November 29th in his study, November 29th, 1947. That was the same day that in New York City, the United Nations General Assembly was voting to approve the UN plan that would establish an independent Jewish state in Palestine. As Sukenik himself said, the coincidence was as follows. He was reading documents, he was holding in his hand documents written by Jewish scribes from more than 2,000 years ago, the last time that an independent Jewish political entity stood in the land of Israel. While listening to the radio, as Jews throughout Israel were doing and Jews around the world were doing, in anticipation of the UN vote to establish a new Jewish state, an independent Jewish state, for the first time in more than 1900 years since the time when these scrolls were written. All of this Professor Sukenik describes in his diary. So there you see the coming together of ancient history and somewhat modern history from the period immediately after World War II. Sukenik, a few weeks or a few months later, was shown the other four scrolls by Mar Samuel. Now keep in mind once more that they are both in Jerusalem, Sukenik again on the western half of the city, Mar Samuel in the eastern half of the city. And Mar Samuel hoped to sell these scrolls to Professor Sukenik when he learned, of course, that Professor Sukenik had bought the other three manuscripts directly from Kando. And needless to say, Professor Sukenik was excited about the prospects of buying these scrolls as well. As it turned out, however, the funding fell through and the Israeli War of Independence was now in full swing as Israel was fighting against a series of Arab armies. So that travel between the different parts of Jerusalem was now not only difficult, but really impossible. Therefore, Professor Sukenik has his three scrolls, Mar Samuel has his four scrolls of the original seven found in Qumran Cave 1. Mar Samuel, accordingly, turned to American and British scholars associated with an institution in East Jerusalem called the American Schools of Oriental Research, or ASOR for short. This is a venerable institution in East Jerusalem. I have visited the place a number of times on my own, enjoyed the company of the scholars there, used their excellent library, and so on. Mar Samuel turns to the ASOR scholars present, Americans and Brits who were there at this time, doing their research in Jerusalem, and he doesn't sell them the documents, but he grants them permission to publish these four documents. So what you have here is Professor Sukenik publishing three documents and the ASOR scholars publishing four. One of those scholars associated with ASOR at that time in residence in Jerusalem was a man named John Trevor. And when Professor Albright, whom we, whom we referred to in Lecture 1, found out about the scrolls, it was in a letter from Professor Albright to Dr. Trevor in Jerusalem where Albright announced that indeed this was the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. All seven scrolls, accordingly, were published as soon as possible with excellent photographs and transcriptions into modern Hebrew typeface so that by 1951, scholars around the world could marvel at these unique documents.
At a very early stage, scholars began to see correspondences between these Dead Sea Scrolls and the group of Jews from antiquity called the Essenes, whom we discussed in the previous lecture. In fact, Professor Sukenik himself had suggested such connections in one of his publications, though he did not develop the thesis fully. The full Essene hypothesis was developed by a French scholar named André dupont sommer who published a monograph already in 1950 in which he posited connections between the Dead Sea Scrolls community and the Essenes as described by Philo and Josephus, our ancient first century CE sources. A second edition of this book was translated into English in 1954 and it was entitled The Jewish Sect of Qumran and the Essenes. The title, as you can see, uh, says it all, the connection between these two groups. As we saw in Lecture 1, as I stated, the Essene hypothesis would become the dominant view of scholars and it is an opinion with which we concur. And I will present this course with that dominant view of scholars, the consensus opinion we might call it, the Dead Sea Scrolls sect was a group of Essenes. We will talk about other opinions that have been offered by scholars from time to time, many of which have important things to say, but we will go with the dominant, the consensus view, the Dead Sea Scroll community and the Essene connection. For the purposes of this lecture, let us pretend that we are the scholars in Jerusalem who are viewing these texts for the first time. The three scrolls obtained by Professor Sukenik. First, an incomplete manuscript of the book of Isaiah. This text resembles very closely in wording and in spelling the medieval copies of the book of Isaiah and incidentally, our modern printed editions of biblical books, Isaiah and all the others, are actually based on these medieval copies. So Professor Sukenik has in front of him a copy of the book of Isaiah, about half of the book of Isaiah is preserved in this text, and it matches exceedingly closely our medieval copies and our modern printed editions. The second text that he has is called the Thanksgiving Hymns. It is a collection of hymns in praise of God, somewhat like the book of Psalms, which is a collection of hymns and prayers written by individuals in ancient Israel. The collection called the Thanksgiving Hymns is a post-biblical document, a collection of similar hymns of praise to God. And the third text that Professor Sukenik holds in his hands is called the War Scroll. It describes the conflict between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Those are the terms that the text actually uses. The text uses explicit and specific military terminology to detail the expected cataclysmic battle that will occur between the sons of light and the sons of darkness in which the former will defeat the latter and this will usher in the messianic age. Those are the three scrolls in Professor Sukenik's um, hands. The four scrolls published by Asor are the following, by the scholars at Asor, John Trevor and his colleagues. These include the following four texts. A complete manuscript of the book of Isaiah. Oddly, however, this one differs remarkably from our later medieval copies. Different wording, different spelling. We'll come back and talk about these differences in just a few moments. But it is a complete copy of Isaiah, 66 chapters. And let me point out that Isaiah is the second longest book in the Bible. The only longer one is the book of Psalms. So to have a complete copy of the second longest book of the Bible from more than 2,000 years ago, you can understand the scholarly excitement of this discovery of a complete Isaiah scroll in Qumran Cave 1. The second text that the Asor scholars publish is called the Community Rule. Actually, early on, it was called the Manual of Discipline, although nowadays scholars more typically use the title, the English uh, title, the Community Rule. This document lays out the basic theological underpinnings and the organization of the community, the community which scholars come to, be call, come to call more and more the Qumran sect, and you'll hear me use that term as well. And in the Community Rule, we see various rules that govern day-to-day -day life by the members of the sect. We'll be looking at this document, the community rule, in detail in our next lecture, Lecture 3. The third text that the ASOR scholars have and publish is called Pesher Chavakuk. Uh, 
It is a commentary on the biblical prophetic book of Habakkuk, and we'll talk about the term Pesher later on in our course. It's a specific genre to the Dead Sea Scrolls community. A fourth scroll is too brittle to open and read, though later efforts would reveal it to be a text called the Genesis Apocryphon. It's a misnomer, actually, as we'll talk about in a later lecture. This text is written in Aramaic, and it provides expansive retellings of portions of the book of Genesis, the story of Noah and the flood, and the story of Abraham and Sarah, for example. But given its extremely poor state of preservation, this document, the Genesis Apocryphon, is very difficult to read. So there you have the seven documents, three published by Sukenik, four published by the Asor scholars. The first question that we, as we assume ourselves now to be the scholars in Jerusalem back in the late 1940s, the first question that we address is, how do these texts wind up in a cave above Qumran? The general consensus is the following. A community of Jews lived nearby in the archaeological ruin known as Khirbet Qumran, mentioned in the previous lecture, easily visible from the cave, and even though the excavations there have not proceeded yet, we assume that there is a connection between the site and the caves, that a group of Jews lived at Khirbet Qumran and stored their documents in these caves. Why and under what, uh, and under what circumstances would they have taken these scrolls and put them in the caves? These were their most valued possessions. Obviously, their biblical books, sacred writings, and even their own compositions, which they considered to be sacred. And what was going on in, let's say, 68 CE? This was the time that the Roman army was advancing throughout the region, approaching the Dead Sea. Eventually, they would besiege Jerusalem and destroy it two years later in the year 70. So one imagines that the Qumran community took these scrolls hid them in the caves and hoped that they would be there for safekeeping until they returned one day. History, however, had something else in store. These Jews never returned to these caves. Almost undoubtedly, the Jews of the region, the Qumran community, and everyone else in the area were caught up in the maelstrom of the Jewish revolt against Rome, which led to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 and the fall of Masada in 73, never to return to the site of Qumran. And there the scrolls remained until a goat strayed from the herd into the cave sometime during the year 1947. We next ask ourselves, why do we have two different versions of the book of Isaiah in front of us? How to explain these divergent texts? Does this mean that centuries after the biblical book of Isaiah was written, there still was not a single canonical version? Let me mention here, by the way, that the book of Isaiah, as we have it in the Bible, is actually the compilation of two distinct works. First, Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, dates to, dates to about 700 BCE, while the second part of the book, chapters 40 through 66, dates to about 540 BCE, and then the two were put together to create the single canonical book of Isaiah. But here we are in Qumran Cave 1, five to seven hundred years after this material was written, and we still don't have a single version that all Jews could agree upon. That is to say we have two different copies of Isaiah with different wording, different spelling, and so on. Now, the incomplete copy that Professor Sukenik published is now called by scholars 1Q Isaiah B, and it reflects Biblical Hebrew very accurately. And as we noted, it conforms very well to our medieval copies. Thus, we may consider this version to be very close to the original book of Isaiah. The complete copy published by the Asor scholars, which comes to be known as 1Q Isaiah A, incorporates linguistic forms distinctive of Qumran Hebrew. I referred, a bit of, I referred to this slightly in the end of Lecture 1, and we will devote a lecture to Qumran Hebrew, a specific dialect that diverges considerably from standard Biblical Hebrew later on. Plus, the text has numerous linguistic updatings. To help you envision these two copies of Isaiah, let me present the analogy of a Shakespearean play. We have, on the one hand, the original text as 
written by Shakespeare, and we have a modernized version, which is sometimes produced on the stage. So if that's helpful to you, you can understand why we might have two different copies of the book of Isaiah in the same cave at Qumran. Let me give you examples of some of the differences in wording that we'll see, but that we see between these two copies of the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 9, the archaic form of the word for field is used. That's the Hebrew word sadai. In, uh, and it's used in many biblical texts. In 1Q Isaiah A, in the complete scroll, which has updated the language, it replaces the archaic form of the word sadai with the standard form sadeh to make it more understandable for later readers. As another illustration, I take the passage from Isaiah chapter 47, verse 2. A unique word occurs there. It occurs only here in the Bible. The word is shovel, and it means something like skirt or a type of garment. That appears in our medieval manuscripts and in any printed edition that you would pick up today. But in the 1Q Isaiah A scroll, this word was probably no longer understood by the readers of this document because, as I mentioned, it's a rare word, it's a unique word, it occurs only here in the Bible, and thus the scribe replaced it with a more common word. He replaced it with the word shulayach, which happens to be a plural form, and it also includes a second feminine singular pronoun in front of, uh, attached to it, so that it means something like your skirts, but it's using a different word, a more common word, replacing the archaic and uh, word shovel, which apparently was no longer understood. So one theory holds that 1Q Isaiah B was intended for reading the original work, whatever that may mean at this point, the original work of Isaiah, while 1Q Isaiah A was used uh, for studying the book of Isaiah in order to uncover the book's true meaning, one needed the assistance of a linguistically updated version to really make it, um, uh, make, make it understood to a community of readers five or seven hundred years after the text was actually written. And again, note the Shakespearean analogy that I provided for you earlier. We emphasize, of course, that this view is highly theoretical, and naturally we can neither prove nor disprove the point. We really do not know why we have two different copies. This is the standard operating hypothesis of scholars. Why two different copies of the book of Isaiah in uh, the same cave at Qumran? Later we will look at other biblical manuscripts from Qumran and we will see that the situation that I have just described here for the Isaiah text is also true of other biblical manuscripts. So that the text of the Bible at this point was still very, very fluid. It would take another couple of centuries probably before the Jewish community agreed on a single canonical text of the Bible without the kind of variations that I've been describing for you. Uh, just a moment ago. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, scholars actually had theorized that the transmission process by which the biblical books had reached us from ancient times, from ancient Israel, through the medieval period until the age of printing was not as smooth as traditionally minded Jews and Christians would have us believe. And indeed, the Dead Sea Scrolls actually confirmed that for us very, very uh, very, very boldly, because we have such variation in the documents from the Qumran corpus. You've heard me use the expression 1Q Isaiah A and 1Q Isaiah B. Let me now describe for you what these sigla mean and how we use these sigla to keep track of the 930 individual documents at Qumran. You'll recall from Lecture 1 that eventually scrolls were found in 11 different caves. So the number before the Q gives us the cave number. So all the texts that I've been talking about here are from Qumran Cave 1, and therefore they begin with a 1. And then the Q stands for Qumran. So 1Q means Qumran Cave 1. Then you have Isaiah, 1Q Isaiah. And because there were two different copies of Isaiah found in Cave 1, we need to distinguish them, and so we refer to one as 1Q Isaiah A, with a superscript A, and 1Q Isaiah B, with a superscript B. And other documents are similarly named and numbered. 
Now, once you get to K4, you will recall that there were more than 500 texts found in K4, many of them fragmentary, and so we cannot associate them with a particular document readily, at least not at first glance, and so scholars used a numbering system. So eventually we will be talking about texts such as 4Q396, right? What does that mean? Well, you know the system by now. Qumran K4, text 396. Essentially, scholars numbered them as they came out of the caves, tried to organize them as well as they could, and gave them numbers. Some of the texts are so well known that they actually get a letter attached to them. The biblical books, of course, get an entire name, as we saw in 1Q Isaiah A or in 1Q Isaiah B. Other texts, some of the sectarian texts in particular, will actually get a number, a name attached to them in addition to their number. So, for example, the community rule, which I've already referred to, and which we will study in detail in our next lecture, is called 1QS. Now, you may say, where does the S come from? Because S is not part of community rule or manual of discipline. S is the Hebrew, stands for the Hebrew word serech, because the text actually begins, and we have the very beginning of this document, it actually has its own title. And the title that it presents is Serech Hayahad, which means the rule of the community or something like that. And therefore, we use the English expression community rule, but we use the abbreviation 1QS. And so it goes with all of these Dead Sea Scrolls documents. It's a system by which scholars are able to keep track of the various texts. And so eventually you'll hear me say things such as 3Q15, and you'll all be up to speed, right? Because you'll know Qumran Cave 3, the 15th text that came out of that cave. And then you'll hear, hear me say 11QT, and you'll say, well, that must be one of the important texts because instead of a number, it actually has a letter, and the letter there is T. That's the Temple Scroll. And in Lecture 1, I referred to the Temple Scroll as one of the last documents to come to light in 1967, eventually published in uh, 1977, 11QT, the Temple Scroll. So here we have the seven scrolls before us. Three, to summarize once more, three of them published by Professor Sue Kenick in West Jerusalem, four of them published by the scholars at ASOR in East Jerusalem, all of them well published and well distributed around the world so that scholars could read wherever you were sitting in any library or in your own private study or in your office on campus, a scholar could read these texts the first time these documents have come to light since they were deposited in a cave almost 1900 years earlier. And then they appeared in English translation very early as well so that the public at large was able to get a sense of what these documents contained. Of these first seven scrolls found in Cave 1, the one that attracts our attention most of all is the one I've referred to several times now, the Community Rule 1QS. We will study this text in detail in our next lecture.